to four, catching up here a little bit. This is from our textbook, uh, the Sustainable Ag, California Ag, uh, Natural History kind of field guide book, pages 39 through 71. It's an introduction to California Ag. So um, crop lands and monoculture is what you see when you go up through the Central Valley. But really, traditionally, the mainstay stay was rangeland, grazing out in undeveloped areas, as it were. We're going to talk about rangeland in a moment. And especially these days, in those days, it was sheep, horses, cattle. Cattle still continues, sheep and, and, and horses and that kind of thing have diminished quite a bit. So, and now today, we're instead of open range, we've gone to what are called confined feeding operations. Those are where we bring the animals into barns, into enclosures, and we bring the food to them. And we're going to talk about those a little bit as well. So, um, so open range is when they're out loose on thousands of acres of, uh, of, of lands for weeks at a time. And then only when we want to we bring them in only for small animals, for protection from predators, sheep, chickens, and all that. And we bring them in when we want to get them ready for market when we basically want to fatten, fatten them up. So next one here. So there's a picture of our, uh, of our, of our, whoop, of our open range there. And uh, that could very well be in the Mojave. In fact, I think I did take that picture out at Las Flores Ranch, where we've got some open range going on. And we're gonna be visiting that on our, on our field trip. So, uh, so animals are in close quarters. It's also called a feedlot or zero grazing. In other words, it's no grazing. You bring the food to them. And it's especially important in dairy. In fact, dairy is California's number one uh, product. And they're mostly confined feeding operations with very few exceptions. Um, the kind of cool thing about them is that it's a mixed uh, group of feedstuffs. Sometimes we'll grow alfalfa in fields around and we'll be seeing that on our big field trip, our big two-day field trip. But they also include ag byproducts, things from processing ag. So sugar beet pulp, for example, or cottonseed hulls from, from producing cotton. In California we still produce a lot of cotton even though it's water intensive. In the, in the, in the uh, San Joaquin Central Valley, Bakersfield to all the way up to Reading, basically. And that keeps it out of landfills. And this is a part we often miss with this whole discussion, global warming and, and the contribution of cattle, because methane from cattle is a significant contribution to global warming. We forget the fact that if we keep this food out of, out of the landfills and into animals, we produce something and then we don't have it um, actually go to methane when it's in the landfill. So that's a big conversation we could have in another class. Uh, a feed of cattle is beef, where we bring them into feedlots. There's a huge one up on the I-15 Harris Farms that are some people I've worked with over the years in some ways. And you basically feed them up. You get them ready for, for market. Um, and you, it's a rapid preparation for slaughter. Okay, so there we go. This is actually Harris feedlot right here, hundreds of cows. Last time I drove by there, something was off and it smelled really badly, but normally it just smells like cattle poop. And here they are. Um, you know, a lot of pushback on this. Is this cruel, unusual? Well, we'll see when we go to the dairy. I think you'll see that dairy cows are very happy to have their feed brought to them as long as they're not mistreated. And, and, I, and we'll be talking about, we'll actually have Earl Graham come in and talk about that whole animal cruelty thing and what's real and what's not real about that. Um, ag byproducts, let's see if I can actually um, get this to play. Whoop. Carlos, can you see if you could push on the, on the, on the recorder, no, on the, on, on, on the computer. Is there a little button there for you to play this video? Just click on there and see if it will play. Okay, that's fine. So there's a little video there. What we're actually looking at there is cottonseed hulls. And right over there is actually almond, uh, almond shells. And both of these are used by local dairies for cattle feed. They're very high in protein. They're good feed stuff. And we had a nice little video there of 
Kenny DeFries, the, the, the owner of the Hinkley Dairy. So you guys will be getting to visit this, so that's kind of cool, but this is just an introduction of that. Um, dairies and these, these CAFOs, um, let me catch up with us a little bit here. Um, there's about 10 of them left in the West Mojave. So we're a small part of this 1.8 million dairy cows in California. That's a heck of a lot of, lot of cows. That's half the population of LA County in LA right now at about 3.5, 4 million. And it's a huge $4.5 billion industry. Um, and we've got 10 left here in the West Mojave and we're desperately trying to keep them gone, keep them economically viable. And as we'll be talking about, they have some challenges. We actually do have a lecture later on dairy and animals in general. Goats for meat and milk, that's what kind of I do. I should have tried to put one of my photos in here. I just breed goats for the local fair. Um, that it depends on who, you, who you're working with. With certain cultures, that's a very important part of their culture. Um, the same old story that just raising animals and let's say beef, for example, goes a little bit beyond just raising them simply for the meat. It's a cultural thing. It's an important part of certain cultures. Excuse me. Get my little dingle dangle there in the right place. Um, and it depends on prices, just like everything else. The whole industry is dependent, the animal industry is dependent on prices. Beef prices have been way up in the last few years and that's really helped um, the beef industry, but they vary a lot. So there's a picture of a dairy cow, one of the Holstein crosses um, out at Hinkley Dairy. Those are some of the, the lovely ladies that you guys are gonna be able to get to visit. All right. So, um, the thing about grass-fed trend, we're going to talk about that. There's a big trend for health, for, to have animals grass-fed. And let's just focus in on beef at this, at this stage. Later on in the animal thing, we'll talk about range-raised chickens and those important. But definitely alpha-omega fatty acids, the ones that are probably bad for our cholesterol and bad for our hearts. If we raise animals on range, on grass, where they're eating grass, they're not kind of fed uh, grains and, and high protein, high energy foods like that, then they will produce less alpha omega fatty acids. And they will also pr put less fat in general into the meat. And so those are healthy. And so there's been this huge push towards grass fed operations. Um, for, the, for this meat. And we'll be visiting True Beef, which is Earl Graham's operation out at Las Flores Ranch. And he'll be talking about that. Of course, price is really important. At the price for him, he markets mostly directly to San Diego through his own company. And the price is much more, uh, much higher uh, for, his, for his product, okay? Um, <coughs> of course, if we're going to do this and we're going to continue raising animals outdoors, um, eating what I think there's another part to this whole thing is should we be feeding cattle animal, animal food or human food? And there's a big trade-off here, especially when prices of things like corn start to go up, then we've seen situations where the, the price for basic staples, let's look at our southern neighbors and a lot of people in this country, a stable is is corn, you know, for, for tortillas or whatever it is. And we've seen it become to where basically we've got the cattle competing with the humans. Now the way that, the, that we do this is by encouraging corn ethanol. We make ethanol out of corn. If you take one of my other classes, you'll see that to me that's a completely unviable option and not a good idea. But we have to look at how do we do this? Well, if we graze food that we can't eat, I don't think any of us are gonna go out there and start grazing on the local bushes or the grasses out there right now, even though they look super tasty. I mean, I was looking outside my window out there in the desert this morning and the desert's just absolutely stunning right now, right? Um, it looks like those flowers are so beautiful, it looks like you can eat them, but I don't think we'd do that. Okay, so price is higher. Natural beef began in late 70s. So this is a new natural grass-fed 
range raise, you start hearing all these terms. This is a fairly new trend, okay? But it, it's a different trick, it's a different diet. These are not as marbled. That's the, the fat inside the meat, and they're not as tender as, as you would generally find in, uh, in the stuff that you would buy in the regular supermarket. Okay, so there's just a couple of pictures of, of things. There's some range, uh, raised chickens. Carlos, when he gave this lecture the other day, was talking about, we're talking about chicken tractors. Basically, these things here, these covered things actually move and they go across the grass so the chickens can actually eat, eat, eat grass. You're still gonna have to supplement them with some grain. Okay, um, rangeland, what is it? talk about the raised land, well it's really a variable term, it just means anything that's not developed for agriculture. So around here, rangeland is desert, so this all around us here at VVC, that's rangeland. Of course up in the mountains, the grasses, grasslands, that's also rangeland. The forest service right above us is rangeland. And I think the key for us to understand is that a lot of it, 50% of it, is controlled by government agencies in California. Very unusual across the world to have that much government land. And so we start looking at Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service. On our, on our field trip, we will be visiting a grazing allotment on rangeland in National Park Service land. We normally think of National Park Service as being very one-dimensional. It's all about habitat conservation and protection and wild animals and all that. Well, no. These agencies are what are called multiple use. They have to allow any kind of use that the public wants to do. So uh, to a limited extent, not on National Park Service land, but you've got to allow OHV, off-road high highway vehicle use. You've got to allow mining. You've got to look at these big, uh, big solar plants that want to come in and put these solar plants on our desert land. You've got to balance all of those. And of course, the most traditional use was to be grazed by cattle. And there's been some pushback from that, especially on National Park Service land in the Mojave. Um, they were sued and Bureau of Land Management was sued a few years ago about how they managed that. And they've had to cut back severely on the amount of grazing allotment, the grazing rights. Okay, so um, let's see. We're semi-desert, so we talked about that really. That's called, that's rangeland. Oh, that's the, uh, I need to move that slide ahead. ahead. Okay, um, cattle and calves are normally the lar largest commodity. This is just agricultural term. This is for beef, means that you're producing cattle and the calves. Um, grazing's oldest practice, got that. Modern day brand inspector. You know, used to be these cattle are branded out on the range, and we still have a brand inspector in San Bernardino County. That's one of the jobs that you guys could could uh, look for. Um, kind of dwindling, but still out there. The Dust Bowl, talked about that earlier. That's where it was overgrazed in, the, in Oklahoma and those areas, and it caused huge soil erosion. Um, and people had to move west, a lot of, a lot of Californians' ancestors came here from Oklahoma because of the Dust Bowl. And at that time, we'll be talking later, we got the West, the Taylor Grazing Act. This is what manages the stocking rate. How much cattle can we actually graze out there on the semi-desert range in the Mojave Desert? Well, that's very strictly controlled. So the chance of another Dust Bowl where the grass is overgrazed, they died, and then we had big soil erosion is probably, um, is in my opinion, uh, not, not really gonna happen again. So that's what an overgrazed semi-desert looks like. Obviously, lots of bad things are gonna happen there. The wrong species are gonna come in. They're not as nutritious. It's gonna change it. We're gonna get a lot of soil erosion. Um, but uh, well-managed grazing, like we'll see out at Las Flores Ranch, is actually, can actually help. We'll be looking at how that ranch, properly grazed out here in Las Flores, at the top of our watershed, has actually improved and what the advantages are to us, even to the extent of our water quality. A lot of our water comes off, off that ranch, and so if it wasn't properly managed, we would have more water, water quality issues. 
Okay, obviously if you're going to plow it or laser level it, make it real level so we can flood irrigate it uh, for crops, then obviously grazing is a lot less damage. Okay, the stocking rate, we're going to talk about that later, how many animals can go on. Um, so the other thing about California that's unique is again, we've got this Mediterranean climate we talked about, right? So in the summers, when your calves and everything are growing strong, that's when you have the least amount of food because we don't have rain in the summer. We have a Mediterranean summer, Mediterranean climate with rain in the winter, okay? Um, and that's where animals have to be supplemented with their feed. So they can't really stay out on the range all year long without some limited exception. Okay? Um, one thing that's very traditional for us, uh, I haven't seen it in the last couple of years, I'm hoping it'll happen this year, is sheep grazing. This is in the Mojave Desert, so out where I live, a little bit away from everything. Traditionally, I think Wigberto has probably seen this in his area. Um, in the Marianas, sheep grazing from, uh, from mostly from Bakersfield would bring in large groups of sheep. And so at this time of the year, you'd see sheep grazing all across the Mojave. Uh, just for a couple of months, just picking up on those grazing. It's kind of interesting because they, they just come in, it's on private land, they don't really ask anyone, they just kind of do it. It's kind of a tradition. And uh, I'm glad that they're still able to do that because it's good management. Properly grazed land is well actually improves the, the, the function and the stability of that land. If we don't graze the land, we get a lot of extra grass, we get extra fire. We also get the bushes actually start taking over and we lose the balance between grass and shrubs in the, in the desert. So grazing, it's controversial, but in my opinion, grazing and lots of other people's is an important part of managing our desert. Okay. Um, another thing we do with pasture land is that the, after the crops harvested, we graze the livestock on the land. So let's say we did corn, then we'll bring livestock in behind it, cattle or sheep, to graze down what's left. Okay. Uh, important distinction between rangeland is that it's unirrigated. If we're going to irrigate it with water, with irrigation systems, then that's called pasture. If it's out there and we're not irrigating it, then it's rangeland, okay? Um, so anyway, pasture, if it's irrigated or not, is a highly significant source, source of feed in California for animals. Okay, there's a, there's a, a pasture-managed dairy. These cattle are not having their food brought to, they're like the ones we'll see, their, their food brought to them. These, these are dairy cattle. Anybody know what uh, what kind of cows those are? See if you guys are up on your cows. Jerseys, exactly. Is that what you said, Jersey? Yep, yeah, Jerseys. And then there's some, looks like some Holsteins back there that are the very traditional black and whites. But these are actually Jersey. And the New Zealanders like to cross the Jersey with, with the big Holstein. These produce a lot of milk. These produce a lot of high quality milk. Very high butter fat, a lot of, a lot of Good for making butter and cheese and things like that. Uh, irrigated pasture is important for forage. Okay, I talked about that. Pasture land uses a lot of water. So we'll be talking a little bit out on our trip and in our water thing, we grow not pasture out here, but we grow a lot of hay. We grow a lot of alfalfa. And it's important um, for, for locally for our economy out in the Hinkley, Barstow area mostly, but it uses a lot of water and we are in an area where we have to manage our water very carefully. Okay, so um, we're going to kind of talk to you, give you a little bit of a history on grasses and hay. So Carlos, if you're ready for the, the big show and tell, we're going to try a new little experiment here. By the way, for you guys that are just coming in, I'm just re-recording this lecture real quick and then we're going to, Carlos is going to give his lecture. Okay, so, thanks. So when you're talking about grass, um, when we're talking about hay, hay is simply dried grass. You bring it down to, you, you cure it, you dry it out on the field, you cut it. With hay, we can take, the easiest way to explain this, and I'm gonna start at the back and work back. This is straw, and after we're done, we'll pass this around, you guys can look at it. 
very thick grained, almost not nutritious at all. So let's focus in on one really important grass and that's wheat. Okay, you guys hopefully maybe had wheaties this morning, very important part. Staple, one of the staple uh, grains for us here in the United States. If we grow it for wheat, we let it get really big. Wheat will get about this big and we let it go to seed. And we harvest that seed. We bring in those big harvesters and we take the seed and that's the wheat. That's what we make our bread and our pastas and all of that out of. What's left is strictly a waste product. This is basically a woody material. This is straw. I built my house with it. So bales of straw, so it's got other uses. But it's not an animal feed, it's straw. You can see uh, goats will like peck at it and just, just because they like to eat anything, but they really don't get any nutrition out of it. That's straw, okay? Now hay, oh, this will be, <laughs> we're gonna make a big mess in here today. Oh, you got a box, okay, cool. So Carlos gonna put us up hay, we don't let it go to seed. So let's say we're talking about wheat hay. It's not very common to do wheat hay, but let's keep it in the, keep the thing going. We cut it before it goes to seed. So we have very fine, uh, very, then you can't quite see it, but it's green, it's nutritious. Uh, regular grass hay is about 8% protein, so it's not quite enough for growing animals, but it's okay for maintenance. But it's just dried grass, and we cut it before it goes to seed. So it's still really green. And that's, that's grass and that's grass hay. The sec, the last one we're gonna look at is, is the kind of cream of the crop, which is alfalfa. Alfalfa is also a grass, a grass. But what's different about alfalfa than other grasses? Anybody know? That's who, we got some plant people in here. Brandon, what's different about alfalfa compared to rye grass or or Johnson grass, or any of those. Anybody? It's what? It's a die cut. I think it is. Yeah, but what else is about it? It's a something with an L. It's a legume. It actually takes nitrogen out of the air and fixes it in its roots. Why is that significant? Because protein is made up to fairly large extent of nitrogen. So it basically gets its own fertilizer and that lifts its protein. So this guy here is a very, very high quality feed. It's got a, it's got a protein value. Remember I told you grass have about 8%. This has got a protein value of up to 18, 20, 22%. And so this is the kind of stuff we feed directly to dairy cows. And they can produce high protein products like milk. Okay, or if we're feeding animals like my goats right now, they're getting ready for the fair, so they're eating a lot of this stuff. So that's alfalfa hay, it's a legume. Okay, then the last one we're going to show you while we're talking about is I'm going to show you what grains are. Not that we don't know what these are, but we also feed animals when we want to supplement them, when we want to grow them faster, or if they're zero grazed, specifically uh, pork, we, we feed them grain. So those are some grains. That's a mixture of corn and barley. And there's some little pelleted things in there that have extra vitamins and minerals in them. That's a complete feed for, for animals as well. But here's the issue right here. Now we're starting to compete with people. And it's a legitimate case now with sustainable agriculture and all these people. How much of this can we afford to do? In this country we can. But I can guarantee you if in Africa, the animals aren't eating that. They're eating that. And I love to eat this. It's really tasty. You guys can come up and taste some of it later. It's got molasses in it. Really cool. It'll keep you, keep you working right, I can tell you that. <laughs> All right, so can we flip back, Carlos? All right. Problem? Okay, so where are we here? Pasture, hay crops. Okay, now we're going to move on to irrigation. Alfalfa, there it is. In Mojave, we have quite a lot of, of alfalfa grown. We can get six to eight cuttings. So that's very high production, but it uses a lot of water, especially in Hinkley area and, and Newberry Springs. They are at the end of the water line. We'll be talking about that a little bit when we do our lecture next week about, I think it's next week about water and irrigation. 
Water is a big issue down there, so we've got to be very careful. So to solve that, again, the Mojave Desert is kind of famous for being extremely innovative. This, this what you're looking at here, and I'll you know, show you next week, I, is the most innovative irrigation system in the world. It's one of these big boom systems that goes in a circle, right? And, um, and it actually drags a drip line. That's a little bag. That's actually a little sock. And the water comes down the sock. And this is alfalfa growing, and it drags between it and puts the water right at the roots. So it can't evaporate. We don't lose a lot. It's 95% efficient. And this is one of the few systems like this in the world. And it happens to be, it's just called a, 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 a drip, they don't even have a name for it yet. It's a, it's a drip boom system. The normal one, which is also way efficient, is, whoop, I'm gonna give you a quick thing. The old system of doing it is I would have had an irrigation ditch over here, and I would have just flooded this. I would just open some little gates, I put some siphon tubes in, and we flood the whole field. Very, very inefficient. Less than 50%, most of it evaporates. All the salts are left behind and the soil start to get very saline. We'll be talking about that a little bit. That's a big problem, getting too salty. The next best is to develop one of these boom systems. And then the next best after that, which we have a ton of them in the Mojave, is to have these drop. See, there's a boom system and those are the sprayers going and those are leaper systems, low pressure systems and they they're right at the top of the of the of the crop and so they're very efficient they're getting right to the crop we have low evaporation and and they're about 80 percent efficient so but then like i said we've also got the, we'll be looking at one of these systems in the desert they're putting in in, in in hinkley they're putting another one in actually it's related to pg and e the hinkley chromium 6 Thing and mitigating that, taking care of that pollution problem. And you guys will be learning about that in the field trip. If you're in the water class, we'll go into that in more detail. Okay, policy. So we're gonna switch a little bit right now. California is the most regulated state, or if you wanna look at it as a country, is the eighth largest economy, the most regulated country in the world, right? So we can whine and go on and say that's terrible and they're and they're messing with our, our capitalistic thing, or we can say, hey, what, what are we gonna do about it? And in Cal when you're in this business, in farming or production, you just have to roll with it. So a few years ago, they passed a thing called Proposition 2, and probably quite a few of you voted for it. But lots of pictures floating around that purported to show cruelty to farm animals. Um, you'll be hearing from Earl Graham how lots, some of those were manufactured by some of these groups like PETA. Um, and he's got some really real-world, first-hand stories of them doing that. But it basically purported that the way, way we do animals, industrialized animal production, is cruel. We bring animals together in small spaces, it's cruel. And one of the big ones is putting too many chickens in the cages. And we agree. They, people had got out of hand. They had many cases just putting too many. But let me also tell you that a chicken in a cage is a very happy chicken. You, he's getting all his food brought to him and as long as it's not crowded and, and all those problems, it's, it's not an issue. So we tend to anthropomorphize it. We look at it from a human perspective. We wouldn't like to be in a cage, but a chicken, if he doesn't have to walk five miles to get his food, and all of that, it's actually healthier. The eggs are actually healthier in the sense that they don't get as much disease. It's not on the ground, You're not getting pooped on. There's two sides to the story. So anyway, we passed Proposition 2, the Animal Cruelty Act, and we stopped a few things. We stopped things like overcrowding of chickens. We stopped the thing that was really stupid called Ferrari crates for pigs which was really crazy. The pigs are not smart. They're the smartest farm animals, but they're still not smart. When they have babies, and they generally have between 20, 10 and 20 babies, they invariably lie down and squash three or four of them. They just do. And you, you know when it's happened, because there's the worst feeling, terrible, terrible, ugly thing that happens. And what you do with, with pigs is you put them in a crate. 
and the sow for the first few weeks stays in that crate and the pigs come up from the outside. They're free and they can come to the mom and back to prevent that problem. If you take a photo from it and you don't explain the problem, it looks terrible. It looks like this poor, kid, this poor pig is in this crate all its life. Well, that's just not true. It's actually the safest, most humane. She's so tired and so eating so much and kind of a little bit overweight maybe. She's very happy to be in there, let me tell you. And the pig, little piglets are definitely at an advantage for her being. But those were banned in California. So what happens? Production moves out of state. So right after that, beginning of last year, who noticed that price of eggs went through the roof? This is the reason. We also did come up with standards and there's a lot of chicken egg farms. We have some chicken farms here locally. Has anybody noticed where we have chicken farms locally? Lucerne, where else? Really close to here. We have a chicken farm really, really close. You could, if we stood on the roof, we could actually see it. In Deep Creek, right? Are you on Deep Creek? Yeah, so Deep Creek, just as you turn off Bear Valley Road, go down, there's actually a, a chicken ranch there. Yeah, just before you go over the hill. They're, uh, they keep kind of a low profile, so you don't really notice. All right, um, so caring for an enemy clearly and squarely in the eye of the public, and that's cool. Nobody wants to be doing this. Let me just tell you, if you're in animal husbandry, like I, that's my background, the last thing you're gonna do is mistreat animals. That's why you got into animal husbandry in the first place, is to take care of them. Where they get the idea that we wanna get in there and hurt animals, but on the other hand, they're there for a purpose, right? So whether it's rodeo, whether it's horse racing, whether it's producing meat, there's a purpose. So if you want to be on the other side and you're going to be a vegetarian all your life and you're never going to ride a horse, then cool. That's all right. You've got a right to that opinion. It's okay. But what we say is you don't have a right to limit other people's way of life is, is kind of the, the push and pull, right? And so it's a push and pull and, and this stuff has helped a lot. Any of those bad practices, and they were very, very limited, have tended to go away. But Earl, again, will tell you some stories in his perspective on some of the stuff as having run one of the biggest cattle sale yards and auctioneer houses in the country. He'll, he'll talk to you about that. Okay, um, ranches. So we, we oh, next thing we want to talk about is open space and, and how there's a competition between urban development and the environment and ranches. Ranches always had the nicest land down in the rivers and that's also open and in, in competition for open space, recreational areas, okay? Okay, so we do want this. This is, this is a picture taken in Yosemite. Uh, we need this, we want this. This is, this, this, this is part of who we are and, and there's a big push to conserve this. And lots of times, branching and agriculture can work really well to enhance this but keep branching going. And that's what sustainability is all about. Okay, um, rangeland can be ma maintained and habitat use and improved that we can restore it. Um, there's a little, there's a little uh, endangered species called the tiger salamander up in the Sierras. And it lives in all the little dams that the ranchers have, have built for, to, to uh, as a, as a food source for the animals, okay? And so they now will get actual conservation grants to maintain those little dams that they built handmade so that the tiger salamander can use. In the Mojave Desert, we'll be talking about water sources. A lot of the water sources in the Mojave Desert, the national park, were put in by the ranchers. There's these things called a guzzler. Anybody know what a guzzler is? Yeah, pretty cool. You can see them. I saw one yesterday. They're, they're up here and above the Marianas. They they build a concrete platform and it grows underground. And those and it has a water source. And those were developed by the ranchers for the animals. But they, if they left or they left them behind, well, the push and pull is between the managers and the environmentalists saying, okay, well now we need to, those were for cattle, so we need to remove those water sources. The other people that I come, side I come from said, no, they've been there, they've been there for almost 200 years. I think that the local habitat has adapted to that. And the wildlife will actually be seriously hurt if you close down those water sources. 
might be a spring, it might be a little dam, whatever it is. So there's this whole push and pull, whereas if we all work together with good stewardship, that we can actually improve the quality of land for the environmental side and for, for the animal side or the ranching side, the agriculture side. Okay, uh, farming at the urban fringe. Obviously, California has seen a huge increase in population and the farms are moving up. We talked about this already, okay? Um, and then also they like to be along the freeways. So, and people want to be close to freeways so they, if they live in, in, a, in a suburban area so they can get to their jobs and that kind of stuff. So there's a competition between the land along the freeways, like along the I, I-5 corridor through the San Joaquin Valley, okay? Um, locally grown foods are really important. Things like the slow food movement, I love this name, a brilliant name as opposed to the fast food movement, right? Slow food movement is grow locally, eat seasonal food, eat, eat uh, organically locally grown food. Uh, California cuisine is an actual, actual trademark, an actual movement, right? Market dining, what you're, what you're actually eating, what's actually going to market in your local areas. Um, so, the thing that I like about this, this is the whole side of agriculture that I think we forget about. We've all got disconnected from the land and food is one way to connect people again. So they understand it. If they don't understand the land, they'll never be responsible for taking care of it. If you truly know that your milk doesn't come from the back end of Stater Brothers, from some kind of machine that's in the back end of Stater Brothers, you kind of know that it comes from a cow, but you have no idea what it takes for that cow to produce the milk. You guys will get a little bit of a look at that. Or, and then you get some crazy ideas like all the milk's got antibiotics in it, and it's got pesticides in it, and it's gonna kill you for sure. And this, you know, we're in the age of anybody can put anything on the internet. And in, in some limited cases, there's some truth to that. But people at the core, are disconnected. They don't. We locally here, many of us, well, I didn't grow up here, but people growing up here, if they're in FFA, 4-H, they get connected with the land. And that's really critical. Because otherwise, we don't know what we have. We don't even appreciate it. That's the idea of that watershed tour we're going to do, is to connect you guys with what we've got here. So you appreciate it. I don't really care how much you learn. I want you to connect and go, wow. I live in a cool place, not like my son say, where did you grow up? Oh, we grew up in the dirt and we moved to San Diego County as fast as we could. And I'm like, no. And they don't really believe that, but that's the sentiment, right? Get the heck out of here as quick as well, we live in the most, the most diverse semi-desert in the world. We live in this, this magnificent place. And a lot of it goes around conservation and land management and some, to some extent agriculture. Okay. Um, distribution, so a big thing we would talk about in, in the other lecture that I will just put up online, the global, local, global food one, which is lecture five. Um, you guys watch it online. I will have it recorded this week for you. We grow enough food. We produce enough food in the world, but we can't distribute it. We can't get it to the people that need it. That's the key. Okay? And same thing in California. That's why transportation is key. Um, and now we're going to get into export. We talked about, I think in this class, there's an alfalfa hay exporter in this area right over here. Smash the bales down, export them to places like China, where they now are really affluent enough to want to um, eat differently and eat dairy products and meat and all those kinds of things. Um, distribution, stay small, local and adaptable is really important because markets change. Farming is a very unpredictable uh, game. Uh, organic and alternative agriculture is really big. Farmers markets, we have one here that, that kind of front part of it doubles as a flea market, which breaks my heart, but the back part, kind of a farmer's market. But, you know, both stuff is supposed to come from, what is 100 miles? Yep. Is, is within the area, and hopefully it's local, but 
You know, I still don't know. Shouldn't be able to buy everything any time over there, but you can pretty much. You can buy just about it. But it's it's step in the right direction. Eating seasonally like we used to do. Any product doesn't grow year round. And so you can't expect in the middle of winter to be eating all this variety of anything you want. That's kind of how you have to start eating if you're gonna if you're gonna be more locally focused. Okay. Uh, CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, is another cool movement. We had one in Phelan. I don't know if it's still out there or not. Basically, you pay into it. You can go and volunteer to help pay off your piece of it. But you get a basket, a, uh, a cardboard box of the produce every week. Anybody know if there's one in Phelan? There was one in Phelan. There's tons of them uh, in, down the hill. Carlos, you know of some, right? Not down there. Um, so you pick operations, my favorite thing, go, go and pick uh, berries or cherries or something and see if you can make yourself totally sick while you're picking them so that you eat most of the, what you paid and then you take some stuff home. Egg ecotourism, wonderful concept all over the world. You know, you go to a, you go to a bee farm, you go to uh, um, some little Dairy, we went to a dairy in, in New York that, that was open to the public and, and sold their products right out of the dairy. Um, we used to have one here, which is just here on Bear Valley Road, where they, where they used to have the, the uh, they used to have the cornfields and they had the uh, Harvest Festival, what's it, what's it, what's the name for your other holiday that said Harvest Festival, um, what is it called? Thanks, no, I'm not saying that other one. With the nasty people come out, yeah, that scares me. But they had a little, that's ag ecotourism. Let's use agriculture as a place for kids and people to visit and enjoy themselves. Okay. Uh, some people, Neville included, purchase the cheapest for, food for their budget. I still, if I go over here to the farmer's market and it's too inexpensive, it shouldn't be that expensive over here because we'll talk about it in a moment how that could be so much cheaper at a farmer's market. They don't have to go through all the middle people. All the marketing costs should be cheaper at the farmer's market. It generally isn't. But I still believe that our food is healthy and good. And so I, go to, I encourage my wife when we go to the dollar store as much as possible. They have really cool deals over there. So, but. If we're going to do this thing of organic, local, we've got to make sure that the price makes sense. Otherwise, we can't affect that the people that most need it um, can have access. So that's the social side of it. It can't be that this stuff is just for the elite. Okay? Um, so there's a, there's a message there. Um, there's a lot of concerns about in agriculture ethics and practices. We're going to deal with some of them. Carlos is going to start dealing today with how do we cut down on pesticides, GMOs, genetically modified organisms, competition for water, food safety, uh, all kinds of issues around that, animal cruelty, fertilizer runoff, hormones in food, da -da 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 -da. there's a whole bunch of them. And they're all legitimate. And as in agriculture, we've got to find a way of making that, you know, healthy for people, that's safety, that's the social side. You can't, we can't affect people's health it has to be economically viable and it also has to support the environment. And that can be done. Uh, what, what does the public want? Just a few ideas. Locally grown, seasonal, boycott transported foreign foods. You know, stuff gets flown in by the megaton every day on, on planes. What about all the energy that that takes if you're flying in your berries from, from Chile or something? Okay. Should meat and eggs be, be free range? Uh, should we grow our own produce? Yeah, you can. If you live in the Mojave Desert and you look out there, you have to become, I don't know what you become, because I love all the critters, but everything I've grown out there in the desert, I think I produced one tomato last year. The animals just devastated it. Doesn't matter, we've got all these crazy animals. The hardest one for me to even touch, I won't even touch them, is the kangaroo rat. Have you guys seen a kangaroo rat? They're awesome! They're the most beautiful thing. They stand up on their back legs, they're super friendly, they come around my campfire at night, 
There, I can't, I can't kill those things if they're in my garden. I just can't do it. So they're like, they've got the salad bar, you know. Uh, ethics of cruelty-free eating. Okay, cool. I don't, I think we've got the highest standards at our abattoirs and our slaughterhouses. Um, I don't think we have an issue here, but again. I respect people that think like this because it's better than the person who's just sitting on the couch and not even thinking about these issues. They're a lot better. But, you know, it helps for, for them to see, see the other side and we should try to see things from their side too. Uh, do we have a duty to eat meat to keep our culture? A lot of people think this, you know. Beef, that's what we are. We're Americans. We're cowboys, cowgirls. We should eat beef. Well, all right. That's a, not a bad concept. I like beef. Okay, urban sprawl. So real quick, couple of things on this. Two of the things here that get confused. One is urban sprawl, urbanization. One is urban sprawl. We have a lot of that here. I have seven and a half acres where I am in this gorgeous little valley. But I break up that land. When I put a house there, I limit the range of certain animals. Specifically things like mountain lions. Okay, our local mountain lions, and we have tons of them. They're doing extremely well, just if you didn't know that. They, but they have a range of 200 miles, okay? So they're gonna come wandering through and you'll see in the paper there's a big song and dance when Fluffy or Kitty gets eaten by a mountain lion in his area. Well, just doing his round. Sorry, folks. You've got a Fluffy, you need to keep him inside, okay? Sorry. Tough, tough, tough break. Shouldn't, you should have a real dog anyway. No, I'm sorry. Um, so, Anyway, that's urban sprawl. We break it up. It, that's, that, it, it, we make little islands out of things. And that affects everything. It affects things like road runners. We, it affects people, things like uh, the burrowing owls. You know, we break up the land, we disturb their habitat. Not because we destroy the rest of the land, but we break it up into, into islands and it messes up their habitat. Urban development is when I actually come and put one of those planned unit developments right on the land. And that's what has happened to a lot of agricultural land as well. It's been developed. It's really prime land, it's arable, it's flat, it's, and it's in pe places that people live, want to live. I have no idea why somebody wants to live in Fresno, because if you think living in Apple Valley or Victorville is tough with the weather, you should try Fresno. It's smog and it's nasty and it's hot and it's just terrible, but, but they do. So California is cool, that's for sure. Um, so working landscapes, we need to think, if we're gonna have a working landscape, we'll have people living on it, we'll be doing agriculture, we'll be doing environmental stuff, we'll be doing open space, and it comes down to sustainability. We just need to think these issues through and then we can balance them. Not everybody gets exactly what they want, right? We don't get, for example, I would like to not to look out one side of my house and see a bunch of OHV trails up the hill where people are just going off the trails. I would love not to see them. But on the other hand, I don't get to say OHV vehicles, and I have one myself, should be banned from, from, from society, right? There's other people that think that should happen, or that we have to balance these. Things. Stewardship ethic. Of, basically realizing that we're put here to take care of these things. Um, so also we've got some interesting things to happen. I mean, one of the things we're gonna see, one of the ways that this can be done is like if you visit the Salton Sea, you can see them growing hay. They actually grow uh, mostly wheat for the snow geese when they come down there and they're tens and tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. At, for their migration, but then they turn it into hay when they leave. About this time of year, they're starting to head back north and they turn it hay. Camp Katy, which is out beyond Barstow, doing the same thing with Fish and Wildlife Service and the group Ducks Unlimited. They are producing food for upland birds, quail specifically, and it's used to teach young kids how to hunt. And hunting is a very sound uh, conservation practice. Uh, than one of the other classes, but then it also improves the habitat. 
and they can also turn that into hay later in the year if they want to. So it requires these trade-offs, it requires a lot of education. Our labor supply, uh, we will do a lecture on later on. Basically, this comes down to our policy on immigration. We talk about the Oki migration. Um, and so, you know, back here, it's not maybe quite as simple as just putting up a wall. That we economically also depend, our economy depends on, on labor supply that might be on the other side of that wall. Okay? Um, just things to think about. New markets. All kinds of new markets all over the world. The ones I'm going to point to is global affluence. As, as people have more money, the first thing they want to do is eat differently. And that's where dairy and meat becomes huge. The China dairy industry is exploding. They, that's why this alfalfa has been shipped there. Uh, environmental issues, transportation, energy, health scares, E. coli and stuff like that in the food, standards are still being developed for sustainable agriculture and organic agriculture. Organics looks good, might have the stamp, but are those organic standards actually being enforced? Climate change and affecting our Sierra snowpack specifically where 50% of our water comes from, uh, that's a big deal if we lose that water. It'd be a really big deal. Water supply, I'm just gonna go over this real quick because we'll come back to this in another lecture. Uh, Central Valley Project is the biggest one. These are the biggest water projects in the world. It acts as a subsidy to agriculture. And the way this works is those water supply, those water supplies for irrigation were developed for under the pretense for agriculture. Then they're often used for, for urban areas, but those bonds and that payment were never paid back. The farmers don't have to pay that back. They just get to benefit from all this stuff. So it's like a subsidy, it supports agriculture. Some people think that's good and fair and nice, other people don't agree. Uh, huge sustainability issues with the water supply. We take the water class, we get into that earthquakes, engineering, environmental. Um, so product prices drive a lot of, a lot of uh, things and we have a lot, of, a lot of prices that are supported artificially. Uh, pest, integrated pest management, Carlos can talk about that. Energy costs and energy, we have the most stringent global warming uh, legislation, AB32 in the world and agriculture has to work around that. For example, agriculture right now is being asked and forced to change all their tractors to newer, more uh, smog, uh, less smog producing tractors and machinery. Okay. Global demand, only thing I'm going to point to here because you've got these slides, uh, 11 billion, 30% of California ag agriculture goes to export. We sit at the edge of the Pacific Rim, we've got these great ports, exports are huge. Right, there we are. Thank you, Carlos. Can you stop us there? Thank you.